Well, good evening, everyone. I hope I find you and your family and your friends safe and in good health tonight. I'm Craig McLean, the Executive Director of the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, aka LUMCON. And I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight for the second talk in LUMCON's online ser science series. Every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central, we're inviting a Louisiana scientist to share their research. And we'll give you the opportunity to listen in to and ask questions to some truly amazing people doing some extraordinary science. And I hope you'll continue to join us each week as we explore more and more of our world from the comfort of our homes. You can find out more information about the complete series on our website, uh, lumcon.edu. Just scroll down on the home page to the link under the news and events. Well, this is normally the time where I would be introducing one of the other fantastic Louisiana scientists that we have in our lineup, but tonight I get the privilege uh, to introduce myself. And so with that, I'll go ahead and begin my presentation. Uh, let's see here. Uh, great, so tonight I wanna be talking about alligators in the abyss. And in the full, whoa, let's see here. There we go. Uh, in the fall of 2018, my research took a rather unexpected and unusual turn. And by the end of the 2018, three dead alligators, all six to seven foot in length, sat to walk in freezer at LumCon. And my goal, along with my research lab, was to send each of these on a one way ticket to the abyss. Now, you need to know before we begin the story that the American alligator is a conservation success story, and it's a win for the Endangered Species Act. In Louisiana alone, in the last 30 years, we went to, from one, uh, just 100,000 to well over a million and a half um, total individuals. Here you can see a plot uh, that is the total uh, coastal nest count, um, and that's in thousands there uh, by year. Um, and that's just for Louisiana. And you can see from the late 70s all the way up to current, there's been a, a steady increase in the number of alligator nests. Um, this success story really occurs through some very heavy regulation and management of both alligator farming and hunting. Um, it occurs through a tagging process for both the sellers and trappers and hunters of alligators, as well as the buyers of alligators. Indeed, research itself with alligators is even regulated. And so this, um, the three that we acquired for the work that I'm about to tell you about were, uh, were what we call nuisance alligators. These are often aggressive individuals in highly populated areas or more often in areas of ecological sensitivity. Now, I mentioned this because um, you to get three alligators you have to follow state procedures and that led to some very odd conversations and email exchanges about what i actually wanted to do with these alligators um so through a variety of of very odd email exchanges in late 2018 i acquired three i'll be slightly damaged carcasses the members of my research group affectionately named um but of course, naming them allowed us more than their tag numbers of 898-309, 898-3110, and 898-321 to distinguish them individually and sort of help keep their fates um, uh, in mind. So the platform for this research um, is my beloved ship, the RV Pelican. Um, and this research was all conducted in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so the Gulf of Mexico and the Pelican sort of serves as the science platform for this weird science tale. But let's take a step back. I wasn't planning on becoming an alligator biologist at any point in my career or at some point in my life becoming the owner of three dead alligators. In fact, I can't remember a time in my life where I didn't want to be a marine biologist and an ocean explorer. But of course, nowhere in that journey did I think it would entail alligators. And indeed, until the fall of 2018, my career looked like that of a normal marine biologist. I scuba dived, I was on boats, I was trying not to lose expensive things in the ocean, I was posing in safety gear. And most of my research had focused on the, on the deep oceans. And when we say the deep sea, we mean those habitats in the ocean that are below 200 meters depth. And at that depth is about the last 
the last bits of light sort of go away. And so most of my work has been between 200 meters depth and four to 5,000 meters depth in the world's oceans. Now for reference there, you can see a little small Eiffel Tower um, there at, uh, at about 200 meters. Well, the average depth of the world's ocean is, four, is 14 Eiffel Towers deep. And so most of our habit, most of our planet is actually considered, uh, would be deep sea. So let me reintroduce you to our blue planet. Um, in this uh, map that I'm showing you here in uh, land is in green, those parts of the oceans that are less than one Eiffel Tower deep are in orange and those deeper than an Eiffel Tower, the deep sea are all in blue. And so you can see that our planet is almost completely dominated by deep sea. Yet despite its size, we still don't know very much about the deep oceans. In this figure here, uh, let me bring up my pin so I can talk about these. Oh, that doesn't seem to be working, unfortunately. Um, here what we have is a plot and you can think of this plot here um, along the y-axis is, is depth and then along the x-axis is just distance from shore and each of those little blocks represent a sort of distance from shore and a certain depth and so you can see there and the very shallow depths near to shore it's very bright red and that means that it's well explored those colors there represent the number of records we have or number of observations we have for animals and so as we go deeper and we get further away from the coast uh, and get further offshore, those colors go to blue indicating we know much less about those environments that are deep and far offshore. And in fact, every year we discover new species in the deep ocean. This is the Yeti crab uh, that was discovered in 2005. You can see its, uh, its claws there and its legs are actually covered in uh, all of these filamentous hairs that are actually bacteria. Um, there's a new uh, Yeti crab species that was discovered a few years ago um, called the Hoff crab, actually named after David Hasselhoff because it has a very furry um, chest. Um, in 2015, a uh, dear colleague of mine, uh, Chris Ma at the Smithsonian, actually discovered a new starfish on one of the cruises that he was out to sea with me on and uh, named that uh, starfish after me. And so every year, including this year, dozens of new species are being described from the deep ocean. Now, the other thing you need to know is that the deep sea is completely dark. And this is a framed photograph of the deep ocean. And that darkness actually means that there's no photosynthesis um, in the deep ocean as well, because there's no light to drive photosynthesis. So the deep oceans actually lack this base of food chain that other environments are uh, have. And so the question is, is, where do the deep oceans get their food? Where do they get their carbon? Well, most of that carbon sinks down as particulate matter from the ocean surface all the way to the deep sea. We call, and this is decaying uh, organisms, bacteria, uh, fecal material, all of that stuff rains down on the deep oceans. And that, uh, we call that marine snow. And that's where most of the, uh, what most of the deep sea animals eat. Now, if we think of all of that food that's being produced at the ocean surface as a five pound bag of sugar, then the amount that would arrive to the deep sea floor um, is less than two tablespoons. And so the amount of food that arrives to the deep sea floor is both of low quantity, but also of pretty low quality because it's being munched on by organisms as uh, that marine snow uh, sinks through the ocean column. And so I've talked about this carbon that sort of um, is produced at the ocean surface, but another source of carbon that happens in the deep oceans is that carbon that starts on land and then um, gets pushed out to sea, usually around major river uh, outfalls like the Mississippi. And so some of, uh, more recently, my career has focused on that part of the carbon cycle um, that is where carbon is transported from land and into the oceans. Now, one of the things that, um, before I get to alligators, one of the other ways that uh, food gets 
into the deep oceans is through wood. And so uh, my lab has actually placed lots of bundles of wood like this one here wrapped up off of California. Um, this is at about 3000 meters deep. And there's a variety of organisms that will actually bore into that wood and eat that wood. So it becomes a nutritional source. And we've done a series of experiments that we just finished up earlier this year um, with over 200 of these placed logs across the Gulf of Mexico. Now, one of the other ways that the deep oceans get food is through the sinking of large food parcels. Um, and these tend to be a very major carbon source. And what, when I say this, it can be dead whales, sharks, uh, large fish, sea lions, sometimes even large algae. Um, and these food falls are consumed by a variety of small and large organisms. Which brings us back to alligators in the abyss. So I kind of attribute this whole alligator thing to three distinct events. When in 2016, I moved from Duke University to take the helm of LUMCON, um, during that trip, my Jeep broke down twice. That's not germane to the story, but I'm still pretty bitter about that. So that was the first event that happened. The, number, the second event is I hired a local undergraduate and a bona fide Cajun to work in my lab. And he was the person who asked upon hearing about scientists doing these well falls and exploring these well falls if anyone had done an alligator fall. Here, here's Chase uh, dressed up me like uh, up like me for Halloween. Um, that's not relevant to the story either, but I'm still bitter about it. Um, obviously, number three, as I begin to think scientifically about this issue, see crocodilians, which include caimans and the crocodiles and the alligators, are really species rich group that's distributed globally in very large numbers. And that means that they're a huge carbon store. Um, and their distributions often also often occur near the ocean or in the ocean. And so saltwater crocodiles, they'll take long migrations between oceanic islands or along coastlines. The American alligator is often found on beaches. Um, here's one, uh, there's an alligator there out on Grand Isle. Um, you can often see them swimming in surf. They often, the males will often take up uh, residence on some of the barrier islands. So this seems to suggest that there's a potential for alligators to be interacting with the oceans and potentially enter into an ocean food web. There's another interesting science question that comes out of this, um, which is before the age of mammals, the oceans were actually filled with large marine reptiles. So before there were whale falls, there were large marine uh, reptile falls. And so at one point in our prehistoric oceans, dying pleosaurs sinking the deep could have been a thing. Although pleosaur fall doesn't roll off the tongue in the way that the whale fall does. And so uh, this is Osidex, a bone eating worm uh, or zombie worm that's only found on these large whale falls and other large sea lion falls and things like that. And so they are tied to um, they are tied to these large food falls like dead whales. And up to this day, there are dozens of new species being described. Um, and they seem to have an affinity for particular types of bones. And so the question really is, if we put an alligator fall on the deep sea floor, would it attract a new kind of ocidex and a type of ocidex that only occurs on, on alligators? The interesting thing about these worms is what you're seeing here is actually the female. Now, um, there's a she has a plume at the top that's the breathing uh, breathing organs, and then she has a set of roots that actually she extends into the bones, which helps her extract lip, lipids. Uh, the first described species, Osidax uh, mucoflorus, actually is Latin for what it sounds like, mucus flower, uh, denoting their sort of snotty flower-like appearance. So with all of the, these three events in motion, in the spring of 2019, we're on board the RV Pelican and we're tying alligator up in what looks like some very odd science experiment. And uh, those ropes are actually allow us to grab that alligator with an underwater robot on the seafloor and position them. Now, of course, the Pelican, the RV Pelican doesn't have a large science freezer just a small one. And so here among English muffins and frozen vegetables, 
we stored the three alligators, the plastic over the head is so we don't startle the ship's chef during the cruise. And then uh, on the seafloor, we then position them into place using an underwater robot or a remote operated vehicle. So now I'm gonna shift to a little bit of video here. Waiting for this to come up. And so you can see here, this, one, uh, this is um, Lucky. Um, the third of the alligators, and we are deploying him here at 2,000 meters. You can see the little depth gauge there um, on the upper right side, and uh, that's that's basically it. We used to keep the alligator carcasses from rolling around the deep sea floor. We uh, tied them uh, to a 45-pound weight. Now that 45-pound weight is going to become important uh, later on in this story. So what we didn't realize at the time that we did these alligator experiments was that each of these three would meet a, a really different fate. Now this is Stumpy on the bottom at site one and within 24 hours, the alligator hide was ripped uh, into by giant deep sea isopods. Um, and within hours, this alligators, uh, the alligator carbon was entering in the deep sea food chain. And so, Let's see here. Uh, show you a little bit more video of this. So here you can see John isopods. Each of these are roly poly about the size of a small football. And they, within 24 hours, have found soft spots in the uh, the alligator's hide to dig into. Um, they're almost eating this alligator from the inside out at this point. Um, you can also see they're making a mess of the deep sea floor. All that sediment you see stirred up is from them uh, uh, moving around, obviously, and uh, uh, beating their flaps. If you want to see the full videos of these, you can actually go to LumCon's YouTube channel in which we have two five-minute videos that show uh, uh, most of, of, of everything you'd want to see. And so, like I said, uh, those giant isopods are indeed deep sea cousins of pill bugs and roly polies. Um, they grow up to two feet in length. Um, they're actually scavengers, uh, uh, very prominent in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, what's really cool about giant isopods is they have amazing fat restores, uh, fat stores, um, and uh, they once uh, they feast on, say, an alligator carcass or a dead whale or something along that line, they can actually go up to two years without eating. Uh, we know this because in the Okinawa Aquarium, they have giant isopods um, on exhibit, and uh, it's um, they know how long it's been since they last ate. So there's amazing um, the starvation resistance that allows them to survive in the deep ocean um, between these large meals. Um, we've, after the, we deployed Frankie Three Toes at around 50 days later, um, we came back and he was completely consumed. Um, all that remained was his bones. Um, note here that you can see that the, uh, the head, the skull is actually turned over here, likely due to the feeding frenzy. Um, that red fluffy appearance on the bones is actually a brand new species of Oxidex, um, bone eating worm. And if we zoom in a little bit on that, you can see here, um, again, each of those millimeter size uh, worm females are actually uh, digging into the bone, extracting the lipids, and um, actually pulling up um, all of that, all of that nutrition. 
Um, and you can see here that, that it's just carpeting that entire skull. Um, you've heard me mention the females, and you're probably asking, well, what about male ossidex? Well, they're parasitic. Um, uh, parasitic on the females are actually microscopic. They don't lack, they lack guts. And a female will have um, upwards of 100 or more males that inhabit her trunk. She'll have a harem of males that actually use, feed off of her um, and only get her back sperm. Um, lucky turned out to not be so lucky. Um, eight days later, we just found a depression. And let me bring this up now. Let's see. I'm going to play you some more video here. So you can see here so that 45 pound weight and the rope coming off the weight should have been tied to Lucky. And you can see that it's been severed. Um, there is nothing attached to it. And if I show you this other video, Here's the depression where we actually deployed them. And that bucket lid there tied to rope and a weight um, is where we originally deployed it. Now in the background there, that faint little line of rope you can see is what we were just looking at to attach that 45 pound weight. So whatever consumed Lucky picked him up, drug him, which is about uh, 20 to 25 uh, feet, uh, drug that 45 pound weight that distance. And so, like I was saying, um, there's been something large, uh, probably a shark, um, and we hypothesize that either a six skull shark or potentially a Greenland shark um, came and consumed Lucky whole, and then drug, and was it, this is the only organism we know large enough to be able to drag a 45 pound weight that um, more, than, you know, more than 20 feet. So, one of the things we were curious about is, how compared to uh, fish on the deep sea floor or dead whales, uh, how fast they're consumed? How fast is an alligator consumed? Are these giant isopods or these sharks consuming them at a rate that's faster than some of the other um, studies that we know about? And so here along the x-axis is just the size of different carcasses. And then the uh, y-axis here is just how much uh, of that carcass has been consumed uh, at this time of these experiments. And each of those dots is a different experiment. And so all of those gray dots at the bottom um, are squid and fish. And then um, at the upper part of that curve, you can see whales. And then in there in the middle, you see dolphins. Um, and then that green dot is our alligator experiment. And what you see here is that, you know, compared to probably what have been a similar size uh, large fish or something like that, it's perhaps a little bit slower. Um, but the alligator fall, um, it seems to be in line with the rates at which dolphins and seals um, are consumed by scavengers on the deep sea floor. And so um, now it seems like there may be some slowing there and that could be related to the tough hide of the, of the alligator. One of the other things we've done, and this is um, work that's done by River Dixon, a, my PhD student, um, is we took cores around uh, the alligator. Um, and what we're doing there is we're, uh, we're collecting uh, bits of the mud and we're looking at the microorganisms that live in the sediment. And what we wanna know is if the feeding frenzy that went around the alligator either disturbed the sediment or did some of that alligator's car carbon actually make it into the food web of the microorganisms that are living in the mud. And so you can see here, here's a, a photograph of several of the kinds of organisms we see uh, in one of these cores. Um, 
these are the uh, organisms found in a single core, um, and they include, a, if you look through there, you can see uh, lots of little clams, um, there's some tiny snails, um, lots of different types of worms, a brittle star. Um, one of my favorite things there on the second row, uh, two in from the uh, left, is a little tiny sea anemone actually attached to a grain of sand. There's another one on uh, the, the second to the last row there in the middle as well. Um, there's a variety of crustaceans, everything from lollipop shrimp and ghost shrimp um, to amphipods and isopods as well. So there's a huge amount of biodiversity that actually occurs in, in the mud of the deep sea floor. And so what we want to know again is how much of that carbon is being um, inserted into this food web. Now one of the key ways we can look at this is just ask, well, if there's more food available, we would expect more individuals um, in the mud closer to the alligator than we would far away. And River's work actually shows this quite nicely. So here uh, on the um, x-axis is the, just the distance to the alligator. And you go from very near the alligator there um, in the green, and then as you move towards brown, we're further away into the background mud. Um, and you can see that the abundance, the total number of animals, regardless of the species, um, that are in uh, those cores are actually much, there's quite a few more individuals in those cores than there are the ones further away from the alligator, suggesting that some of that carbon from uh, that alligator is actually making it into the sediment and actually driving uh, a lot of reproduction and growth among those organisms. Now we can also look at whether that this increase in food availability also promotes biodiversity. Does it lead to more uh, species? And again, Rivers' work shows this nicely too. Here we have um, how many different species there are in each one of those cores versus distance alligator. And you can see that as we get closer to the alligator, there's just a lot more species, almost double to triple that of what was um, in the background. So, um, what did we learn? Well, from this, other than just us playing around with the alligators in the deep sea. Well, the, the first thing we found is that a significant amount of this carbon enters into the deep sea food web um, through these mobile scavengers. So things like giant isopods or potentially even large sharks. And so uh, these organisms are very uh, important in that first step of getting um, this food fall carbon into the deep sea food web. But what we also learned is that there are several types of animals that can be the entry point for this alligator's carbon into the deep sea food web, um, whether it's a bone-eating worm or a giant isopod, um, or if it's a um, or if it's a large shark. Um, but it looks like these large mobile scavengers are kind of messy eaters and they're inefficient, and so in that they don't completely consume all the carbon themselves, and some of that actually makes it into the sediment and appears to be utilized by this sort of rich diversity of microorganisms that occur there. And of course, we discovered uh, a new species of bone-eating worm, um, and that's a this is the first uh, bone-eating worm uh, known from the Gulf of Mexico, and obviously the first one known from an alligator. Um, and so, yeah, that points to um, yet another pathway in which, again, this alligator's carbon can get it, uh, can move into um, deep sea food webs. And I should mention that we uh, were lucky enough to collaborate with uh, Greg Rouse at Scripps on the on the on the discovery of that new species. Um, I think what we've shown really importantly is that alligator carbon is is feed is a feasible um, way in which carbon from land gets into the ocean and can be utilized in the deep oceans. And in fact, we've done uh, some calculations, and if you just take the total number of American alligators and sort of take an average weight for them and calculate how much carbon that would be. It'd be close to 8,000 metric tons. Now, a single alligator represents about 136 days of respiration for a local deep sea community, so a community in the mud. And uh, so if they consumed all of that alligator's carbon um, and it uh, you know, converted that into carbon dioxide to drive the respiration, uh, drive their metabolism, um, that would last them 136 days. Now, if only 1% of all the alligators, um, you know, along the Gulf make it into the deep sea, this could drive a single, a single community for, you know, almost 7,500 years. 
or it could cover all the communities over a single hectare for an entire year. So there's a considerable uh, promise, I guess, for there being some linkages and important linkages between the deep oceans and uh, dying alligators. Now, of course, I believe in science that allows us to be uh, both creative and whimsical, obviously. But the larger questions about how carbon moves around in our oceans and how uh, organisms respond to that carbon um, is also a really important one. We know that by 21, or we predict that by 2100, our oceans will have much less carbon and much less life. And so here along the x-axis, you see a plot for the North Atlantic Ocean um, from 1970 um, predicted into uh, the future to uh, 2100. And that red line is the, uh, the, well, let's start with the green line. The green line is the sort of change in net primary production. So that's the how much carbon is being produced in the oceans. And you can see here that in the red line, which is the change in total animal life, the total biomass, how much the total all life weighs, that also goes down um, according to the predictions of this model. And so this sort of represents, and you can see also uh, the black line there is to change in temperature. So we also have a warming a warming ocean as well. And this sort of loss of food and a warming temperature is kind of a one-two punch for the oceans, including the deep oceans that are already food limited. And so understanding how the deep sea gets its carbon and what those pathways are, are important in sort of um, understanding um, all the carbon highways and how they're going to be impacted um, in, in a changed uh, ocean future. And so I want to thank the other members of my lab who are all affiliated with this. Dr. Clifton Nunnally, a research scientist with my group, uh, River Dixon, a PhD student, and Granger Hanks, a uh, lab technician. All of these uh, were, all of these great people were involved in this work and it wouldn't have uh, existed without them. And with that, I will stop and take any questions. All right, thank you, Dr. McLean. That was perfect. And we have so many questions coming in. <laughs> Excellent, let's go for so, it. So many great questions coming in. Um, so before I open the audio, I'll just take care of the ones that uh, have been typed. Um, and so, I, and before I start giving the questions, if we don't get to your questions, there's over a hundred of you who are attending tonight's talk. So if we don't get to your question, I apologize, but um, there's no way that I can get to all the questions. So, so we'll just take them as we get them. Okay. So uh, the most fun question that we've gotten is actually from somebody named Tori who I think you know. Um, she wants to know <laughs> <laughs> she wants to know how you came up with the names for each of the alligators and who was responsible for those names. Um, well, I won't mention who's responsible. It was sort of a lab, <laughs> uh, a joint effort. Um, the um, the obviously Stumpy because uh, that alligator was missing one of its uh, feet. Uh, Frankie three toes because he was missing a toe on one of the front legs and then lucky because he was simply just not missing anything. Um, so yeah, <laughs> they were just sort of, uh, they just came about organically, I think. Perfect. Um, then Catherine's question was, is it true that isopods can become so full, they become temporarily immobile? Yes. So, um, there's really, if you go to the video uh, on YouTube of the alligator falls that we posted, there's actually a really good example of this where one of the giant isopods that is in, has gorged itself so much on the alligator that is actually tries to swim off and then it does a nose dive um, into the mud around the alligator. So yes, they can, they can feed themselves so full uh, that they can actually be unable to swim away for a while. That's awesome. Um, do you plan on doing this type of experiment again? We'd like to do, uh, we'd like to do this in shallow water, um, to try to see how the differences of, what differences might occur between, you know, the parts of the oceans that we can dive in, where there's lots of food available, where, uh, the introduction of a large carbon 
input or food available a food parcel like an alligator wouldn't be out of the norm as opposed to the deep sea and see how differently the food webs respond so yeah that's that's planned um you know when we acquire more funding um and we're going out to do more deep sea work we'd like to do some more alligator falls just to see um you know we we only get, had the opportunity to do three so it's not a very large sample size we'd definitely like to repeat the experiment more yep that that's excellent i look forward to that um and then uh karen has kind of a four-part question so i'll just take them one at a time for you um she would like to know how do you categorize the sites where you place the three alligators um specifically how far apart and what made you choose those sites so the three sites we chose are that all three of them were at 2000 meters so we want to keep the depth the same at each so that um if we move shallower or deeper we might get we get different types of animals that occur at different depths so we wanted to make sure that we were controlling for that each of them were a hundred uh kilometers away um one of them was uh, within the mississippi river uh very close to the mississippi river canyon and then the other two were outside of that so we wanted a bit of that comparison uh those sites were actually not chosen specifically for the alligators we were doing i mentioned some of the woodfall work that we've done and those are our long-term study sites for our woodfall experiments and so they were already established sites that we knew that we'd be going uh back and uh forth to uh for other work and so that's the reason why we chose those sites oh perfect so already built into your research program that's right great great um dr mary miller <laughs> who's one of our favorites um would like to know if you could talk a little bit more about the microbial diversity that you saw at each site we, so we did not do uh we didn't do a lot of work with microbial communities um we we have taken microbial samples and we're looking you know we're looking to collaborate oh i think we just lost audio for you craig I'm sorry, we lost your audio for a second. So, uh, I think I think we've lost audio for Craig. Um, so, uh, I will. <laughs> We will try to sh troubleshoot that for a second. So, Craig, we've lost your audio. Uh, we can't. Oh, no I'm longer... sorry. Am I am I back? Yes. Yes, you are. Yep. Yeah. So I was just saying that we collected uh, samples for microbial analysis, but we haven't done that yet. We're actually collaborating with uh, Dr. Marshall Bowles at LumCon on that. Um, so at this point, we, there's not much we can say about the microbial loop and how and the importance of that. But we do know, obviously, the microbial loop is an important part of these food bowls. For sure. Um, Shelby, what is the weirdest drop you've done? And will there be a drop on <laughs> a human drop? Um, so, um, the weird, I mean, I would say the alligator fall is by far the weirdest drop that i've done in the deep sea or probably anybody's done um you know we've done uh we and among among many other labs have actually put deployed cow bones as well to look to see whether osidex will inhabit cow bones um as far as a human fall um there's no plans for that although there is a a uh, very well-known deep sea scientist who has claimed that he's trying to get everything uh, in place to become the first human fall. So we'll have to see about that. Wow, I can imagine that's difficult because of the the remains and what you do with those. But I, I'm sure there's a lot of paperwork and bureaucracy. <laughs> yeah, but it would be interesting. Unfortunately, we do get human bodies on them. C4. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on to a lighter question. Um, Allie is wondering, what was the most surprising discovery? Um, I think, you know, we landed 
uh, with the ROV on the site where uh, the Lucky was the last alligator. And when we first dropped on, we were un we didn't see anything, and we were we were like, well, do we get our lat longs mixed up? Or are we at the wrong site? Um, and of course, we saw the marker. So next to each of the alligators, there's a bucket lid on a rope with, that's tied to a weight that serves as a marker. And the marker was still there, but there was no alligator. And then, of course, we find the depression. And then, so we started doing a search from that site, you know, in a in a search pattern, a way to try to see. We we're hoping to find, you know, that something maybe had moved the alligator, you know, a little further away, and we would find bones and find this food bowl, like we did with the other ones. But um, of course, you know, just finding the 45 pound weight, you know, and it seeing then at the drag marks in the sediment where it had been drugged, you know, like over 20 feet, that was, that was pretty shocking to see the sort of ghost of, you know, of foraging past. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was kind of cool. Um, Karen has a question about how deep sea organisms react to the light from the robots that are placing the alligators. Great question. Sure. So, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of deep sea animals have, three, you know, because it's consistently dark, have pretty primitive uh, visual systems. Um, of course, other, you know, uh, other organisms have pretty sensitive. So we try, you know, we try not to, uh, we not try not to use the maximum intensity lights we have. Um, you know, we try, we, there's a lot of procedures we go through to try to limit our impact on the deep oceans. Okay, so <laughs> this next question is from Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. Um, she's kind of has a long one, so bear with me. Um, so her understanding from the final slide is that we are predicting that there will be a there will gradually be less life in the deep sea in carbon uh, to increasing temperatures. Am I understanding this correctly? And is this due to global warming? Yes. So there's two there's there's two things that are happening in the oceans. One is that they're getting much warmer, and then they're also producing less food. They're producing less carbon. Now, um, for animals that unlike us, organisms unlike us that don't regulate their temperature, their metabolism is driven by the temperature of the environment around them. And so when it warms up, their metabolism go increases. And so as their metabolism increases, obviously they require more food. And so you could, you have a scenario here where you have temperatures increasing, but then there's less, which is, I mean, animals need more food to do the same amount of work, but yet there's less food available in the ocean. And so obviously that have an impact all around the oceans, but in the deep oceans where the organisms are used to living in cold water, so they're particularly sensitive to, to increases in temperature, and they're already at the sort of extreme uh, end member for food limitation already. Those com two combination, you know, they're going to be they're going to take a much bigger hit than a lot of other uh, marine habitats. Thank you. I'm, uh, next question is kind of long too. I'm seeing if I can pare it down a little. Um, Olivia, by the way, says, hi, Craig. Uh, do you think alligator falls could be an important addition to the stepping stone hypothesis for chemosynthetic species di dispersal? Sure. So the idea is that in the deep sea, we have lots of what we call chemosynthetic habitat. So those include places like hydrothermal vents and methane seeps. And these are kind of really cool parts of the ocean where because uh, we are using, uh, in those systems, carbon dioxide or methane, or they're actually through this chemosynthetic process turned into usable carbon. Those, those systems are actually decoupled from the typical sort of photosynthetic um, food pathway that a lot of other organisms are. And so um, these occur throughout the, uh, throughout the deep oceans. And of course, but there's areas between them where no methane seeps or no hydrothermal vents exist. And so the question is, how do the animals disperse between these different, you know, far uh, reaching sites? And so uh, one of the things that happens as wood falls and well falls um, and these large food falls degrade, 
they will actually start producing sulfur and they become little mini chemosynthetic systems. And so some of the species that we find on wood falls um, and uh, some of these larger well falls and things like that, some of those species are actually shared with hydrothermal vents and methane seeps, um, both in terms of the being the same exact species, but or in terms of more of the evolutionary sense that they have cousins, you know, and relatives um, that that you know, uh, where one species may occur um, uh, on a food on a well fall, but then a relative of it will of that species will occur at a hydrothermal vent. So that suggests that deep in their evolutionary past, they they're linked. And so, um, so it's been suggested that these different environments are, um, you know, are stepping stones. Uh, these wood falls, well falls, and things like that are stepping stones between hydrothermal vents and methane seeps. You know, I think that's probably the case for alligators as well. Um, you know, in any of these large food par parcels, um, you know, I think that they're probably all interconnected. Although there are some species, you know, that don't occur, that only occur on sort of, you know, well falls or alligator falls, like bone-eating worms. Obviously, there's some of the some of the worms and clams that occur at hydrothermal vents and methane seeps only occur there. They don't occur on food falls. Great. Um... Carla has a very interesting question that I think we all are interested in the answer for. Um, <laughs> Carla's question is, would you ever be able to record more continuously so that you could potentially see a shark eat a whole carcass? Yeah, that is sort of, that would be ideal. That is exactly the kind of thing that we want to do. But the logistics so of keeping a camera on the deep sea floor are, are pretty complicated, you know. So we're working at, you know, over two kilometers deep. So you have to find, you have to have a, a camera and a pressure a housing um, that is able to record. You have to have, you know, a hard drive capable of, of capturing all that continuous recording um, as well. And of course, that has to be in a pressure housing. And then you need lights that you have to keep on for an extended period of time as well. And, um, you know, and then the battery, the power pack to sort of keep that all going, you know. And so, um you know, our, our obviously our long term goal would be to have that kind of system and those systems do exist, but, you know, they're obviously expensive and pretty rare. Yeah, that it would be awesome to get to get that footage. So um, Tally has an interesting question about ex excrement, <laughs> which is everybody's favorite topic. Um, so Tally is wondering uh, if in the study was the effect and span of excrement on the lower level life considered or was a change noted due to the change due to the change presented on um, with the drops. So um, can you repeat that question again, Mert? I'm not sure I really understand. Sure. So my understanding of the question was. Um, did you account for the life maybe in the sediments um, being there for the excrement, I think, of the isopods, probably? Um, oh, did we? No. I mean, obviously, um, obviously, these large scavengers coming in like giant isopods, you know, they have a huge effect on the surrounding. You saw how much they... Um, you know, they could definitely be a pass-through through carbon. I think probably larger effect of of the giant isopods is just how much they disturbed the sediment around uh the alligators you know they moved a lot you know that's that's a if you're a microorganism living in the sediment around the alligator where the alligator fall is you know you're you know you can be thrashed about by these giant isopods you saw they're just kicking up lots of mud lots of uh, lots of yeah and with that probably lots of animals too perfect there's another animal question so um Um, did you see any other large fauna besides the giant isopods like sea cucumbers and octopus? We saw um, at one of the alligator falls in the distance, we did see a squid um, that was kind of hovering around, but it, we never uh, observed it actually eating on the alligator. We saw large uh, what grenadier fish or what we call rat tails as well. Um, they uh, were always hovering around. Um, they're they're sort of pigeons of the deep sea. They're kind of always around anyway. Um, so those are the two major things that we we saw. 
um, in terms of the larger things. In terms of sea cucumbers, um, we see sea cucumbers all over, obviously, even around some of these alligator falls, but it doesn't, they don't, they're, the number of them didn't seem, seem to be any greater around the alligator falls than what we would expect normally. Perfect. Daniela, the um, person who asked the previous question, um, she also says that your ROV images were incredible. So thank you for thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Terry would like to know what we know about the, li the larval stage or life history of the Ocidex worms. Well, um, we know that they have a larval stage. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say that we don't know much beyond that. You know, for a lot of deep sea animals, you know, they, they have to be able to disperse. They must have a larvae, larval stage that can sort of disperse, you know, hundreds of kilometers, you know, between these different things. Um, but we, we're just now starting to get the handle on that. There's some really great work uh by a colleague of mine up in oregon named craig young with a group out of north carolina um and they are looking at uh larval dispersal between um methane seeps um actually in saying some of the methane seeps in the gulf of mexico for this and so they what they do is they try to learn everything they can about the larvae um and how you know how fast they swim um how long they can live you know um you know and try to model that kind of larval behavior along with um, all modeling these like massive oceanographic currents. And so they have all these simulations that sort of sh show what the probability is and um, of them distributing between different seeps. And what we know from those studies by that, these really great studies from them is that, you know, some of these deep sea larvae can be in the water column for, you know, hundreds of days um, and disperse over, you know, hundreds to thousands of, you know, up to a thousand kilometers or so. And so they can cover amazing distances. Life is amazing. Um, <laughs> Angel, who you also are familiar with, um, is curious about the sensory system of the bone-eating worms, the Ocidex. Are they just lucky to be near a carcass, or do they have sensory systems that allow them to detect a carcass over a distance? Presumably, the large, you know, for these. This is a great question, and it's not just for Ocidex, it's for anything that finds these food falls, um, you know, whether it's the larvae or whether in the case of the giant isopods um, or wood falls, you know, how how do they find that? You know, these these things, you know, these food falls, whether it's an al a dead well or a dead alligator or, um, or it's a, uh, you know, wood fall, they have pretty distinctive chemical signatures. Um, and so, you know, they send off these big chemical plumes that then, you know, not only like things like giant isopods can rapidly respond to, but obviously, you know, the lipids in the water are attracting and, um, you know, things like os like the larvae of Ocidex. Great. Um, Manuel has a question about the species of worms that you've been finding. So um, were they the same among all three alligators or did they vary somewhat? Well, so the only, uh, we never saw the bones of Lucky because he was taken whole. Um, and uh, Stumpy was the original uh, alligator that we haven't actually, after that initial period where we sort of filmed the giant spots, we haven't been able to, re we haven't returned. So the only alligator that we've returned to and saw the bones was uh, Frankie Three Toes. And that was about a little, right at 50 days. And so um, that's the only one where we've observed um, uh, observed Ocidex. Now, the interesting thing is we actually had a parcel of cow ribs actually deployed nearby, um, and that actually also found, we found a new species of Ocidex on those two, uh, and it was different than the one we found on the alligator, even though that they weren't any more than, you know, 30 to 40 feet away from one another. So uh, earlier we had a question about that very topic. Um, so Arturo would uh, like to know, why do you think that you found Oxidex on ga gator bones and not the bovine, bo bovine bones? Um, that's a great question. I mean, it could be just random, you know, what happened to settle on one versus the other and there's no, you know, it's just a, a random process, um, which is definitely a possibility. 
um, you know, uh, one of the other things to think about is that alligator bones actually have a lot of lipids in them, um, and uh, they have a lipid concentration in the bones similar to that of whales, actually. Um, and so, and uh, whereas cow bones are not as rich in lipid reserves um, as whale bones are, and so uh, whale bones or alligator bones, and it could be that the osidex um, that we found on the alligators some, is a species that prefers a really lots of lipid concentration, a really high lipid concentration, and the one that we found the, on the cow bones doesn't, um, you know, prefers a lower concentration of lipids, and so it could be that it could be that if we went out and replicated it out. With well bones at the same site, we might pick up the same species we found on the alligator bones. That's really cool. Look, sounds like you have a lot more work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, our last question for tonight is from Michelle. How likely is it for an alligator or a crocodile to make it to the deep sea before decomposing closer to its typical habitat? That's a great question, not one that we really know. I mean, there, you know, we do know after major flood events, um, uh, you know, that that alligators can be washed offshore. There's lots of, of uh, evidence that, you know, after major storm events, after hurricanes, things like that, that, we, you know, that alligators can be washed um, 20 to 30 to 40 miles offshore. Um, so it's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, and so that combined along with that, with the tough alligator hide, um, you know, sort of puts them in the right place and with a, with a hide that's sort of a little bit more resistant to, um, you know, to being fed upon as well as, um, you know, being degraded by microbes, um, you know, gives it, gives it a real chance. And again, it's, you know, it's also about the sheer numbers. I mean, there's so, you know, we have such a large population of alligators here in Louisiana, um, all along the Gulf Coast. Um, and of course, it's all tied together by a major river system as well. And so there's, there's a, you know, there's a large population of alligators, then there's a highway and a mechanism for them to get out to the, you know, into the ocean. Perfect. Great. So, uh, Everyone who's who's still with us, um, I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for questions. The questions that you asked were spectacular. Uh, thank you for being so interactive with us tonight. Um, just as a couple of reminders, we do have another talk uh, next week, Thursday at 7 p.m. with Dr. Beth Stouffer from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Um, if you did not attend last week, you missed the, the announcement about the great science talk challenge, uh, which, which is if you attend 10 of our lectures, they do not have to be consecutive, you will win a prize. And we actually have one with us tonight to show you. Uh, Dr. McLean has a RV Pelican challenge coin. Ross, we are still working out the rules for the challenge coins. We will come up with some, um, but I see that you've already um, accumulated two talks, so <laughs> you only have eight more to go uh, before you get this great challenge coin from us. Again, you do not have to attend consecutive talks, but if you do attend 10, um, you will get one of these challenge coins, which I know Dr. McLean is very proud of. And of course, everybody at LumCon is they, very proud. They, they are very nice. Yeah. They are very yeah. nice challenge coins. They, they really are. Yeah. So uh, with that, on behalf of especially myself, but the entire LumCon family, thank you so much for attending Dr. McLean's talk tonight. We look forward to interacting with you again very soon in the future. Um, keep us in mind, let your friends and family know that we are going live every Thursday. Um, so I hope you can make, make several more talks. We have lots of great talks coming up. If you are interested in who's coming up and when they're coming up, we have a web page on our website. It's uh, lumcon.edu forward slash science dash talks. Um, that will get you to our lineup and information about upcoming talks. We really hope you come back and, uh, and join us for the rest of the series. We really <laughs> <do>. Sorry. <laughs>
<laughs> sorry. <laughs> so sorry. It's uh yeah, working from home is fun. <laughs> <laughs> but we're getting a lot of great feedback but uh, most of all craig we're getting a lot of thank yous to you for such a great and interesting talk oh it was my pleasure to be able to talk about my science tonight great all right everyone i'm going to end the end the webinar i hope you're all being safe and staying very healthy good night good night all <laughs>